If you think that earning more money is going to magically insulate you from financial trouble, think again. I will never forget the phone call that ushered in my first full-time job offer. When the recruiter told me my official salary, I literally gasped. It was $52,000 and I felt like I had more money than God. My mind immediately started racing to all the incredible things I was going to buy with my new monstrous income, like a Louis Vuitton bag. And I was going to start shopping at Whole Foods instead of Trader Joe's and buying dresses that didn't come off of a sale rack. I literally couldn't believe my good fortune. Then... A few weeks later, I got a bill in the mail for $32 for my August water usage. And I was like, wait, I have to pay for water? And thus began my months long painful realization that still extends to this day that being alive is just really expensive. Growing up, I had to save my money for the fun things that I wanted, like my first cell phone and my pink electric scooter. I was accustomed to the saving money is for going ham at Club Libby Lou mental model of money. But things that we needed, like gas and water and food and school supplies, those were always provided to me, free of charge by my benevolent handlers, mom and dad. The socioeconomic privilege of never having our lights turned off or never having to wear two small shoes felt natural, normal even, because it was all I'd ever known. That's why my transition to adulthood was so damn eye-opening, because it was the first time that my money was devoted to paying for these boring, necessary, run-of-the-mill expenses like water and heat and insurance and doctor's visits. And nothing can prepare you for that feeling until you actually live it. While I knew cognitively that my income would need to support the boring stuff, I had no idea how much the boring stuff was going to cost. So maybe you can relate to this non-exhaustive list of the adult requirements that embarrassingly took me totally by storm. First, I began renting my own apartment with a roommate because my new job was not being the queen. And just like that, $888 of my $2,800 per month take-home pay, poof. But that's okay, right? I thought, $1,900, that's still a ton of money. I can buy a lot with that. Yeah, not so fast. As time passed, I watched more and more of the money trickle out of my checking account. It was 30 some odd dollars for water, another $25 for valet trash, which was a service I asked them to turn off for my unit, only to be told that it was required. Super cute. $40 for my half of Wi-Fi, another $75 for my cell phone bill, somewhere between 60 and 100 each month for electricity. Let's call it 1100 bucks in total. Didn't feel too, too painful at the time because they were paper cut sized hits, like $30 here, $40 there. But the meltdown, the absolute meltdown that ensued when I received my first annual car insurance bill. Geico Gate will never be forgotten. Growing up in rural Kentucky, my car insurance was dirt cheap. It was $600 per year. No comprehensive, no collision, just vibes. And I had mentally steeled myself to that figure, $600. But you can imagine my surprise when after registering my vehicle in the state of Texas and reapplying for a new quote, I learned that my actual car insurance costs would be $1,700 per year. And oh boy, I cried. I cried a lot. I had not planned on a one-time expense so large, especially not so soon after getting my first job, but it would have cost me even more if I had paid monthly, so I emptied some of my savings and I let her rip. But I kept finding myself wondering every few weeks, where did all my money go? Worst yet was the stuff I couldn't plan for, which seemed to happen weirdly frequently. I would run over a nail and need a new tire, $300. Or I'd accidentally go to a doctor who was out of network, $150. It felt like every misstep had a three-digit price tag attached, and every good intention, like, oh, this month I'm actually going to save some money, would be thwarted by something careless, like an out-of-network doctor, or unavoidable, like a nail in the road. It felt utterly demoralizing to work all week for a paycheck that ended up being frittered away on the mundane necessities that I had taken for granted my entire life. It's a little bit like this piece that we published last year that we'll link in the description about how being poor is paradoxically very expensive. And now in retrospect, I find myself wondering, how can anyone expect to get ahead on a sub-living wage in those types of circumstances when every mistake can be so costly? The constant helplessness I felt every time a new, unexpected charge 
through a wrinkle in my Discover statement is ultimately what drove me to become obsessed with personal finance because I felt so out of control and I wanted to feel in control of my financial situation. Because when I heard that I would be earning more than $50,000, I figured that my financial situation would sort itself out by default, that I would effortlessly save money. Because with that much money, how could I ever feel stressed? As I learned in those first few months, it goes a lot faster than you think. So I reasoned with myself that, okay, maybe 50K, not enough, but I bet 80K would be telling myself that if I could just earn more, this stuff wouldn't impact me anymore. So seven years later, I have some reflections. If you find yourself watching this and thinking, why is she talking about this years old experience? Like surely she has escaped from that financial undertow, right? You would be wrong. The reason it feels topical and relevant again is because I realized many years net worth calculations and income changes later, because yes, the $80,000 salary is also in the rear view now, that this personal finance experience is universal. It's practically inescapable because the funny side effect of financial progress is that it usually just serves to unlock larger interferences. A car registration hiccup is replaced by a giant tax bill. Pricey car insurance is now dwarfed by other more expensive types of insurance because now you have more to protect. A tire replacement pales in comparison to major repairs on real estate. As your asset base grows, so too does the scale of your potential liabilities. I'm reminded of Mark Manson's theory in The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. You're always going to have problems. Your problems are just going to become better. If a pipe bursts in your $500,000 house and it costs you $20,000 to repair all the damage, that's annoying, but the underlying truth that you own a home worth half a million dollars is usually a pretty good problem to have, or you could rent, like me. A travel delay on your international vacation that caused you to blow an extra 500 bucks on a different flight? Well, you are someone with enough money, time, and access to travel internationally. Like, there is an implication about your financial position inherent in the type of money problems that you have. Now, this isn't only really supposed to be like a check your privilege exercise and finding silver linings, but a reminder that we will always have expensive, boring, mundane life expenses. When I earned 50,000 and figured by the time I made 80 that this stuff would stop throwing me off course, I misunderstood the fundamental truth of the matter. It will always feel like it costs more than it should just to be a responsible adult because such problems are going to scale proportionally with your income, assets, and access. This is where hoping for the best and preparing for the worst style planning comes into play. Here are a few things that would have helped me smooth the choppiness. So these are my three rules for unexpected expenses. Number one, Build a generous miscellaneous buffer into your monthly expenses plan. Now, this is not your emergency fund. This is different. This is an actual line item in the budget. Because after my second traffic citation, it was a bad year, I literally added an expense category called, oh shit. I assigned 150 bucks a month to it at the time, earmarking the funds for mistakes and accidents. Now, at the time, that represented about 5% of my take-home pay, but it meant it was not money that looked available for other less important things. The mental freedom that that unlocked for me was second to none. It didn't matter that I had to pay $50 for a work fundraiser. I would just stick it in the miscellaneous budget. Now my miscellaneous category is proportionally larger, but it still serves the exact same purpose. The unexpected will take many forms. And in that way, it is predictably common. Anecdotally, it feels like unpredictable expenses usually account for around five to 10% of an overall budget. So if you're currently living a lifestyle that costs $3,000 per month, assume and plan for anywhere between $150 and $300 each month on bullshit. Number two, avoid counting your chickens before they hatch to avoid disappointment or worse. I know this one sounds kind of depressing, but I recently received a bonus that I began making plans for the moment I became aware of its existence months in advance. I decided I was going to spend 10% of it on something frivolous and ridiculous and then invest the other 90%. Then my dog needed a very expensive surgery. I received an unexpected human medical bill and our insurance premium on a new vehicle doubled. In a matter of days, 
far, far more than 10% of the bonus amount had already been accounted for by the litany of unexpected, boring, real person life costs. It reminded me that found money always seems to have a way of being rerouted and making plans for unexpected cash before it even arrives can lead to disappointment when life intervenes. And number three, never accept the first offer. Because in many cases, the things that we're discussing today, like traffic citations and insurance claims and quotes for repairs and utility bill increases, they're typically negotiable. For example, when I blew out my second tire in front of the construction site that I was forced to pass to exit my apartment, I contacted the development company and I sent them an email politely requesting reimbursement given the situation. Eventually, someone at the company replied apologetically and they cut me a check. You just never know if you don't ask. The same goes for denied insurance claims because the medical insurance industry is one that thrives on opacity and a general lack of awareness and education. You can pretty much guess that nine times out of 10, the bill is going to be wrong. So if the bill I received does not match what I was quoted, aka almost always, I call billing and I try to negotiate it down. Oftentimes you can strike a deal. You can say something like, I will pay today if you will cut this bill in half. Or you can get unfair charges taken off entirely, like in the case of preventive care services, which are supposed to be always free and covered by insurance, but rarely are. We'll link a list in the description. And finally, to bastardize the know your worth and add tax axiom, know how much your life costs and add 20%. Doing renovations? Budget for 20% more than you think you should. If you're having a wedding, plan to spend 20% more than whatever the initial estimate says. Getting a new car? Don't forget about the title taxes, fees, annual registration, and insurance costs, which are higher for higher priced cars. Go figure. Part of what made my financial coming of age so painful was just a core misalignment of expectations about what it would take to feel financially secure and what money was ultimately for. My original childish conception of money was what I would need to work for in order to have a lot of fun, not just to keep myself alive. So I was nowhere near as conservative as I should have been in all of my original planning. The same goes for buying your first home, making plans for a tax refund, and finally taking that trip to France. You hope for the best, but you financially plan for the worst. And if you want to hear this week's full episode of The Money with Katie Show, click the link in the description of this video. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of our conversation was, and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I'll see you next week, same time, same place on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Hannah Velez and me, Katie Gaudi-Tossan. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our video editors are Christy Muldoon, Sebastian Vega, and Nicole Friedman. Additional fact checking comes from Kate Brandt.